por ahí. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our committee is holding an oversight hearing on discrimination testing and commission initiated cases at New York City Commission on Human Rights. In 2015, in response to advocate concerns regarding the commission lackluster approach to discrimination enforcement, the Council passed local laws 32 and 33. These laws require the Commission to conduct testing to evaluate discrimination in housing, accommodation, and employment, respectively. In addition to the investigations mandated by these laws, the Commission was also required to deliver a report. Although the laws did not require this investigation or reporting, to be ongoing, the Commission has continued to utilize discrimination testing and has provided the figures in its annual reports. Discrimination testing is a useful method to help investigate systemic wide problem or pattern of discrimination that are occurring in certain fields. Much fair testing is one example that is often used to highlight discrimination testing and hiring. Using a common method, investigators will send out fake resumes with comparable qualification. However, they will include a distinguishing characteristic such as name to indicate gender or race or graduation dates to test for age discrimination. If there are repeated outcomes, for example, if only male candidates are selected for interviews, this provides a red flag that there may be a pattern of discrimination. The Commission also has other tools at its disposal, including a demand for documents, interviews, or case or letters to initiate its own investigation into entities suspected of engaging in discriminatory practices. According to CCHR, such investigative methods are equivalent to the fact gathering mechanisms available to attorneys litigating in state and federal courts. Our oversight hearing today, you know, today through the our uh, oversight hearing today, we are keen to hear testimony regarding how the commission is using testing to tackle discrimination and what methods are particularly useful to provoking commission initiated investigations. Before we begin. I would like to acknowledge the council members, members of the committee who have joined us. We have council member Ben Carlos, council member Perkins, and council member Drew. I would like also to thank the committee staff who work very hard to make this uh, hearing possible. And I want to thank uh, Albani Ayuja, the council to the committee. Thank you very much. Leah Skripek, policy analyst, thank you very much. And also Nevin Singh, financial analyst. And I want to thank also my staff, David Suarez and Vladimir also. Now, we are going to call the first uh, panel. But if, any, if anyone wants to testify and, and didn't fill out uh, the slip, please see, see the surgeon in arm, and you can fill a slip to testify. It's still time to do that. Uh, let me call Mr. 
Ms. Dana, Dana Sussman, the Deputy Commissioner and New York City Commission on Human Rights. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. You may start any time, but before you start, I would like the Council to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you affirm to tell the whole truth, the, tr the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee to, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, thank uh, you. Before you start, Commissioner, give me the opportunity to acknowledge the council member who have joined us, council member Rosenthal and council member Brad Lender. Because we know that you know they are very busy. I don't know if they are going to be able to stay. But thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Commissioner, you may start, Thank please. you. Good afternoon, Chair Eugene and members of the Civil Rights and Human Rights Committee. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the Commission on Human Rights. I'm pleased to be here today to testify on the Commission's testing and investigatory work in the context of Commission-initiated investment investigations and enforcement actions. The Commission has the power to, invest, to initiate its own investigations and resulting enforcement actions when entities are suspected of maintaining or engaging in discriminatory policies or practices. In addition to, in addition to filing complaints and testing, both of which are further described in my testimony, the Commission sends cease and desist letters and also uses a range of investigative methods, such as requests for information on policies and practices, demands for documents, and interviews of key witnesses. Cease and desist letters are a relatively new tool the Commission has been deploying with great success. The letters notify the wrongdoer that the actions taken may be a violation of the city human rights law, demand that discriminatory actions cease, and demand that specific actions be taken, including, for example, restoring a victim of discrimination to the status they were in before the alleged discriminatory action. As you may recall, and as Chair Eugene um, just stated, the Council passed several bills in 2015 on testing. Specifically, Local Law 32 mandated that the Commission undertake five tests in housing between October 2015 and March 2017, and submit a report to the Speaker of the City Council by March 1st, 2017. Similarly, Local Law 33 mandated that the Commission undertake five tests in employment between the same time period, and submit a report to the Speaker by March 1, 2017, and Finally, Local Law 29 changed the Commission's reporting requirements to mandate that the Commission include the following information in, in its annual reports. Inquiries received by the Commission from the public, investigations initiated by the Commission, complaints filed with the Commission, and education and outreach efforts made by the Commission. As you'll see from my, testi from my testimony, while the laws mandating those 10 total tests per year expired in 2016, the Commission continues to far exceed this minimum requirement. In the four years since Commissioner Malalas began her tenure, the Commission has greatly expanded both its testing and Commission-initiated work, strengthening its investigatory toolkit in an effort to target systemic discrimination. Commissioner Malalas created an Assistant Commissioner position who reports to the Deputy Commissioner for the Law Enforcement Bureau to oversee and coordinate the agency's testing work and its Commission-initiated investigations. For the past three plus years, that position has been held by Assistant Commissioner Sapna V. Raj, a former Assistant U.S. Attorney and former head of the Memphis Fair Housing Center. The Bureau uses its ability to initiate its own investigations in several different contexts. The Bureau may become aware of alleged unlawful discriminatory practices through an anonymous tip, information shared by a community-based organization, an elected official, or through social media, or through media reports, for example. A complainant may also come forward to file a complaint about discrimination, and the Law Enforcement Bureau may join and file a commission-initiated case to broaden the scope of the investigation, and in some cases, continue the case to ensure wide-ranging policy changes, monitoring, and other affirmative relief, even if a complainant settles their own individual matter separately. In fiscal year 2018, the commission investigated, the commission initiated investigations covered 25 different protected categories. To highlight a few examples, the commission launched investigations into the policies and practices of employers where repeat instances of sexual harassment came to the commission's attention, opened investigations to address pregnancy discrimination in employment and ensure lactation space for employees, continued expansive testing of employment agencies to identify discrimination against job applicants based on criminal history, investigated the disability accessibility of several mammography centers, regularly intervened on an expedited basis to stop landlords from intimidating tenants because of actual or perceived immigration status. 
the agency launched 583 commission-initiated investigations in fiscal year 2018, which includes testing, a significant increase over the 450 investigations in the calendar year 2017 and 426 in calendar year 2016. I just want to note that um, our, our numbers for fiscal year 2018 are for the fiscal year because our reporting uh, requirements have shifted. So our data for previous years reflects the calendar year. And moving forward, starting in 2018, will reflect the fiscal year. So it's a little bit of an imperfect comparator, but that's um, we're happy to be reporting now on the, on the fiscal year. Um, I've included a chart here in the testimony that breaks down commission-initiated investigations by jurisdiction, jurisdictional area, um, and many of these involve more than one protected class. Um, in testing, the commission uses uh, testing as an investigative tool to confirm whether there is discrimination in housing, employment, or public accommodations. As part of an investigation, we may send testers to potential employers, landlords or real estate brokers, restaurants, hospitals, stores, or other public accommodations to see if our testers are treated differently or are given different information because they belong to a protected class. This is an historically effective tool used in civil rights litigation. In fiscal year 2018, commission testers tested 691 entities, an increase over the calendar year 2017 in which testers performed tests on 577 entities and over 2016 when the commission performed 426 tests. Again, we, we sort of have changed how we track and, um, and report out these numbers. So the 2017 and 2018 numbers are a significant jump over 2016 and before that 2015 because the 2017 and 2018 numbers reflect entities tested, which may involve multiple tests per entity. So um, the number of individual tests is actually higher. In my testimony, you'll see several charts um, that break down tests and employment. Um, you'll see that um, the most common test is um, in conviction and or arrest history, which will also include um, uh, moving forward now and, and through part of fiscal year 2018, tests on salary history, um, tests and employment on pregnancy, um, which was 10, race uh, 15, and gender 2. Tests in housing, a total of 290. Lawful source of income was by far the highest at 222. Race, 36. Disability, um, which includes um, having an emotional support animal at 10, immigration status, 19, and presence of children, 3. Tests in public accommodations, which is a total of 86. Um, again, these are, sorry, the number of entities tested, not the actual individual tests. Disability access was the vast majority at 85, and Creed was one. Um, moving on to commission-initiated complaints. Some commission-initiated investigations lead to the filing of a commission-initiated complaint alleging a pattern or practice violation. In fiscal year 2018, we filed 44 commission-initiated complaints, an increase over 37 in the prior calendar year. Um, and again, I've included a chart in my testimony here um, that uh, lists the number of commission-initiated cases according to jurisdiction and the protected classes. Many complaints allege more than one protected class. For example, the commission filed 30 commission-initiated complaints to address illegal employment practices that discriminate on the basis of arrest and conviction record, and which also have a disparate impact on black and Latinx employees or applicants. These complaints allege violations under four total protected categories, arrest record, conviction record, race, and national origin. And again, you'll see um, broken down the um, the complaints that were filed based on commission-initiated investigations by um, protected by first by jurisdiction and then by protected class in my testimony. Moving on to outcomes of these cases, the commission is often able to resolve commission-initiated cases even before a complaint is filed through its use of pre-complaint investigatory strategies and cease and desist letters. Since 2017, the commission has resolved approximately 65 commission-initiated cases without having to file a complaint. These cases involve some combination of policy changes, training for staff and management, civil penalties, posting of notice of rights, um, or other forms of affirmative relief. Since 2017, the Law Enforcement Bureau has resolved approximately 55 commission-initiated cases where the Law Enforcement Bureau filed a complaint. And these cases also involve some combination of policy changes, training, civil penalties, posting of notice of rights, or, and other forms of affirmative relief. 
I just wanted to highlight a few, I think I've listed four in my testimony here, um, of the kinds of commission-initiated cases that we um, have brought and have resolved in the past year. Um, just to demonstrate the kind of affirmative relief we're seeking, the wide-ranging and creative uh, resolutions uh, that the Law Enforcement Bureau has been able to, to, um, to gain through commission-initiated work. Um, the commission um, has, as I said, um, been able to use its affirmative investigatory powers to garner significant and wide-ranging relief in many cases. In a landmark case late last year, the commission announced that it resolved a commission-initiated investigation against PRC Management, LLC, a housing management company controlling 100 buildings with 5,000 units citywide, charged with discriminating against prospective te tenants based on race, color, and national origin, for denying housing to applicants with criminal history without performing individualized an analysis of those records. The commission required PRC management to pay $55,000 in emotional distress damages to a victim impacted in the case, $25,000 in civil penalties, change and distribute new screening and application policies, train staff on the new policy and on the human rights law, and invite applicants with criminal histories who were previously denied housing to reapply. The management company was fully cooperative um, with the investigation. And I just want to stress that this was the first case of its kind that we are aware of in which a civil rights agency brought a case based on screening out applicants on the basis of criminal history, not a protected category in housing, because of the disparate impact it has on people of color. Last year, the commission announced a settlement with Lenox Hill Radiology following an investigation into allegations of discrimination for failure to accommodate patients with disabilities. As part of the settlement agreement, the commission is requiring Lenox Hill Radiology to modify the front and interior of a building to make it accessible to people with disabilities, provide equipment in line with the US Access Board's accessibility standards to ensure that mammography machines are accessible, change internal scheduling, communications, and equipment purchasing policies citywide, and train all staff on, at its New York City locations to better accommodate patients with, with disabilities. The commission initiated this investigation after it received a letter from the New York Lawyers in the Public Interest identifying these accessibility issues. The commission then tested and visited the facility and verified the claims. Lenox Hill Radiology, which, which fully cooperated with the commission's investigation and settlement process, is currently making the agreed upon changes and the commission will be working to ensure that other facilities in New York City are accessible. Also in 2018, the commission announced a settlement with the condo board of managers at 47-55 39th place in Sunnyside, Queens, following an investigation into reports of tenant harassment, discrimination, and a hostile environment, including displays of Nazi and Confederate imagery, swastikas, and hate symbols in the lobby. You may have remembered this, inc um, this incident. The commission um, uh, launched an investigation after um, uh, this was brought to our attention immediately by Councilmember Jimmy Van Bremer and, and um, other community members. Um, the settlement requires the resignation of three board members, removal of all offensive posters, symbols, and materials from the lobby, changes to the condo's house rules to comply with the city human rights law, including the removal of a provision requiring tenants to prove their immigration status, and amending its no pets policy to include language about accommodating tenants with disabilities. The settlement also requires the new board of managers to create and distribute new written policies detailing its housing obligations under the city human rights law to all unit owners and tenants, post notice of rights prominently in the lobby, and train new, newly elected board members on the city human rights law. The settlement also allows the commission to be present at board of managers' annual meetings and elections to ensure compliance with the settlement and the city, uh, and the, and the city human rights law, and require the new board members to notify the commission of annual meetings for the next two years. In December, um, just a couple months ago, the commission, um, following reports of, of displays featuring racist iconography, um, racist merchandise in Prada stores um, in the city, as well as an employee for facing, uh, facing retaliation for lodging a complaint regarding the display, the commission launched an investigation and, and sent a cease and desist letter to Prada USA Corporation. The letter demanded that the company immediately stop displaying and selling the Prada Malia goods, retaliating against any employees for, for a um, opposing or complaining about the offensive and illegal material and commit to providing city human rights law training for all Prada employees, executives, and independent contractors. Prada has pulled the product line and displays from all stores, but the commission is continuing its investigation and negotiation process to ensure broad remedial action. And lastly, the um, Law Enforcement Bureau at the commission 
through a commission-initiated investigation, found evidence that PROMESA, um, Residential Healthcare Facility, the Puerto Rican Organization to Motivate, Enlight, and Serve Addicts, Incorporated, um, PROMESA Residential Healthcare Facility, Inc., and Acacia Network, Inc., um, maintained policies and practices that resulted in blatant discrimination against transgender people and filed a commission-initiated complaint. These were um, treatment centers, residential treatment centers for substance abuse. Respondents' personnel told commission testers that a transgender woman would be required to room with men. In one test, respondents' staff told a tester that transgender women would be turned away unless, entirely unless a private room was available. And the Law Enforcement Bureau later learned that the facility had only one private room. The commission and respondents entered into a conciliation agreement of, for $10,000 in civil penalties as well as affirmative relief. Respondents agreed to implement policies that clearly prohibit gender-based discrimination and harassment, including by permitting transgender people to participate in all aspects of their services in a manner consistent with their gender identity, including room assignments and other gender-specific programs and facilities. Respondents also agreed to notify organizations that help LGBTQ people connect with substance abuse treatment of their updated policies and organizations that assist LGBTQ job seekers of respondents' external job postings. Lastly, respondents agreed to conduct ongoing anti-discrimination training and to monitoring by the commission. Um, thank you for convening the hearing today on this important topic and the commission's critical work in combating discrimination and harassment through our commission-initiated investigations and testing. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, Uh, thank you for your testimony, Commissioner. And uh, we we know that testing is very important. You know, in the in your effort in the effort of the Commission to tackle uh, discrimination. But uh, could you elaborate on the importance of testing and the, also the method that the Commission is using usually? to tackle discrimination? Sure, so um, I think- Other method in addition to testing, you know, whatever you know, a method or strategies that uh, the commission is using to sure. tackle discrimination. Um, I think, so the, the broader category of commission-initiated investigations and complaints is um, some may involve testing and some may involve other um, investigatory methods. But I think the ability of the agency to initiate its own investigations without a complainant coming forward is critical. Um, there are a host of reasons why someone would not want to file a complaint with their name on it. They may be undocumented and may be concerned. While we do not ask about immigration status, it is not relevant to our case. Um, there are reasons why someone might not want to come forward. Um, they may have. Um, Again, it's a, it's a it's a challenging position to ask people to put themselves in, and so we can receive anonymous tips. We can receive tips from people who say, "I'm happy to talk to you and share with you my name and my information, but I don't want to file my own complaint." Um, we get um, information from community-based organizations all the time. Um, we also monitor media reports and other um, things that are being reported out by. Uh, partner organizations, by news media, through social media, and as I, we think it, we take this function incredibly seriously because it is, um, it fills the gap. It allows us to tackle systemic issues without waiting, essentially waiting for someone to come forward um, and put their name on a complaint. Um, so we also have the ability to monitor filings in state and federal court that um, identify the city human rights law as a claim. And that way we can see sort of, we monitor trends, we can see what industries we might want to focus on, um, think about ways that we might want to broaden an investigation. So if a complainant comes forward, we are looking at those complainants, that complainant's specific facts, that those that complainant specific situation. When the commission is looking at um, broader relief, we are really we are we are the we have the interest of the city in rooting out discrimination. So we are looking at broad systemic change across an employer or a housing provider. Um, that may mean you know civil penalties paid to the city of New York, but more importantly to us, it's policy change 
training, ongoing monitoring. Um, we are looking increasingly at um, restorative and transformative justice approaches as well, um, which you've seen in, in the case summaries I've described, ensuring that if you've turned people away for housing that you are connecting back to those people and saying that they should reapply um, or reaching out to, in the last example, LGBTQ organizations and ensuring that they know that this is a place that they can send their patients and their clients. Um, so again, it's, it's a way that we can address broader systemic problems that have been identified for us or that we are identifying, um, and we find it to be a very um, uh, a fruitful and useful tool in rooting out discrimination. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, we all know that uh, discrimination is a very big, big issue, and, and also important of our great city of New York and, and the country also. And people can be discriminated for many reasons, because of race, religion, ethnicity, and affiliation to groups, and uh, uh, because they're immigrant. And you mentioned something very important. You say that some of the time people, they don't come forward to file you know, for the, the, the cases of discrimination they are facing. This is something that uh, we believe that happens every single day probably in New York City. But let me try to be more precise. In terms of immigrants, but we know that, we all know that, you know, the immigrants, you know, you know, New York City is home to so many immigrant people coming from everywhere, everywhere. And those people, they come with the tradition, the belief, and they come to a new country with new system, new uh, uh, culture. Of course, they are afraid. They don't want to be exposed to government, you know, for many reasons. Some of them, they may be documented or not documented. But I, and I know that in terms of justice and human rights, it's not about documentation. And some of them may not be fluent in English also, in the language. There are many reasons that could prevent them to go forward and to go and uh, you know, apply and to seek justice. But uh, my question to you, Commissioner, what the commission is doing to reach out to those people and to help them, regardless of the, the barrier that they're facing, languages, culture, or anything. What the commission is doing to try to be preventive and proactive, to let them know that, hey, you got a right to come to seek for justice and to, 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 uh, to let us know about the, the cases of discrimination that you are facing, regardless of your immigration status, regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your country of origin, what the commission is doing. So there's a few things that I can um, I can speak to on this. So we are very conscious of um, the challenges that we face, particularly in this political climate of assuring New Yorkers that regardless of their immigration status, they have rights in New York City and they have access to us. We have um, a, a community outreach team in all five boroughs that is um, every day out in communities um, meeting with people in houses of worship, meeting with people in community-based organizations or, or community health centers, meeting people where they are. Um, our staff speak 35 languages across the agency. That's up from approximately six four years ago. Um, that doesn't mean that we have every language available at every moment, but we work really hard to be in communities speaking the language of our community members and being in places that are accessible. Um, we also um, work very closely with community-based organizations that have the trust and the credibility on the ground with immigrant communities. Um, for example, we work with Make the Road every single day um, with Legal Aid Society, with Legal Services NYC, with um, community-based organizations across the boroughs that work with different specific organizations, um, religious groups, um, uh, and and so. We are we we work with those community-based organizations as sort of conduits of our message. Um, one one um, outgrowth of our recent um, report on Muslim, Arab, South Asian, and Jewish just and sick um, New Yorkers experiencing discrimination is what we've called the referral network, which is a network of I think it's six, but hopefully will grow um, as as we um, expand community-based organizations that are now going to be sort of our eyes and ears on the ground. Um, 
connecting with their their clients, their constituents, their members, and will be um, identifying human rights violations in their communities and bringing them directly to our liaisons at the, at the um, at the commission. So we build on partnerships with different community-based organizations. We are out as much as we possibly can in communities. Um, we have small offices in each borough, and we always are excited to partner with you know council members and others on reaching constituents um, and and serving people in the language they speak in their own neighborhoods. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to ask my colleagues to ask some questions because I know that they may have to go. So I'm going to call uh, Council Member John, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chair Eugene, and you're very kind. I have a, a briefing next door uh, with SBS, and that's why I, um, I didn't even ask. You offered, and I thank you for that. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you. It's good to see you, um, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I was very surprised to see uh, the settlement with Promesa and with Acacia. I have Acacia in my district with a, um, with a senior center. Uh, they, I know they run numerous programs, and I think this was specifically with their um, substance abuse programs. Um, and it's very disturbing to me also because um, the city council provides funding to those organizations. And um, I have to say that in two months, I will be 28 years clean and sober. And I had a similar um, experience when I went to substance abuse programs, to rehab actually, um, and um, to be honest with you, it prevented me from getting sober, I believe, um, because there was not a safe space in which I could open up and share my experiences with people. So I know that the, um, uh, the settlement here was that um, you also recommended that um, they reach out to LGBT organizations. Is there any follow-up on that? Do you know that they have? Um, and then um, not only that, I'm like wondering, like, what is the, the content of their substance abuse tr therapy and treatment, and how is it directed specifically to LGBTQ people? So part of the agreement includes monitoring by the commission. So um, I don't have specifics around exactly what they've reported back to us, but what we've ensured in some of these larger scale sort of in-depth um, affirmative relief kinds of resolutions is that they report back to us on their activity. Um, so I can identify more specifically exactly what they're obligated to report back on and how that's, and how that's been going. Um, but this was actually raised to us by some community-based organizations and providers um, that this was a major issue for their patients and their clients, and which is why we had launched this, invest this specific investigation um, in response. So I thank you for sharing that because I think that that just brings home the importance of this of, of making sure that these place that places like this are accessible um, for for everyone to seek treatment. Yeah, I mean, um, sharing maybe for the first time, you know, I was put into um, group therapy. Uh, and by the way, sometimes you get caught up with employee assistance programs that require you to attend programs like this. And then if you don't and go to the program, then the employee assistance program and or court ordered programs uh, will cause you even further trouble. But, you know, people would not want to go if, in fact, they don't think that it's a safe environment in which to open up and to share. So I, I was put into a, a program um, which really involved a lot of uh, very macho type men and the therapist never addressed the uh, the issue for me um, and so it is very very concerning that this is still happening like 28 years after i had those experiences um, so i'm going to look into that further i, I think i'm going to reach out to acacia and to promesa also um, to figure out what's going on um, but i would really urge you as well just to follow up in terms of what is the cultural competency of the training that's going on and, and, and what are they doing about the therapy and the options that they offer there. Hopefully they're not even doing con conversion therapy. I mean, that's been banned now, but you know, I don't know, with these types of allegations, one never knows. Anyway, I, I thank you and I thank you for, for um, exposing this and for letting us know what was going on. I wish that you'll do more of it. It's great to see how much more you're doing of this 
because I've been on this committee for I think since I started here in the council, and um, since Commissioner Malales took over, you have you know really really done a great job on on these issues. So thank you. Thank you, and we'll we'll follow up with you on on some of the more details of the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Jerome. Thank you very much. Now uh, we're going to call uh, Councilmember Lander. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for allowing members to do their questions. It's it's much appreciated. Um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, wonderful to see you and your team here. And I'll echo the chair and, and Councilmember Drum's you know observation about what a difference uh, a commissioner and, and her team make, you know, back in 2015 when uh, I sponsored Local Law 32, there was essentially no meaningful commission investiga uh, initiated investigations taking place, um, uh, you know, and, and uh, not in really in place an agency or a team or a staff to do it. So the work that has been done to rebuild the agency, to set up a whole set of investigations, to get out there and investigate is just encouraging to see and know that New Yorkers who um, you know, were not being protected, even though we had a law that was supposed to protect them, uh, are being protected in much greater numbers now is, is really encouraging. And just hearing some of the individual cases and knowing what a breadth of different kinds of discrimination are out there. Obviously, those people who know to come complain, that's good, and you process those cases. But unfortunately, you know, I think we probably all know the majority of people who are having their rights abridged uh, or facing illegal and discriminatory harassment under uh, discrimination and harassment. Or our laws don't know. Um, we're not going to find them all with investigations, but it's good that we're out there doing it. So thank you for doing all of that. Thank you. Um, I do want to drill down a little on one area where I feel like there's something of a discrepancy between the investigations and the the follow-up for uh, penalties or outcomes, and that's on mm -hmm. source of income. Yep. Uh, so you conducted quite a lot of 222 lawful source of income investigations here on page three of your testimony. Mm -hmm. But then on page four, there's only four, um, uh, four things there in the outcome category. Uh, so I'm just curious. I mean, I think we all know that we're amidst, obviously, an enormous housing crisis. Um, folks are out there with vouchers and other forms of assistance and are being discriminated against. It's right that you're making it a high priority of your testing, uh, but I'm just curious. It, it looks like there's then a drop off between there and and enforcement actions. Right. So can you can you speak to that? Sure, I think I, I can um, address a little bit of that. So the tests, um, right, so 222 entities were tested in lawful source of income, um, representing, as I mentioned, the vast majority of our tests um, or entities tested um, in housing. Many of those cases on the following page, on page four, that table represents complaints filed. Um, so many of those cases don't actually require a complaint to be filed. If we get a positive test, we can call uh, the landlord and say, you may not be aware, but what, we have reason to believe that you have violated the law and you must comply, you must provide, you, mu you must um, uh, ensure that people who have vouchers are not turned away. So these are actually um, complaints filed. And so it's one of the tools we have in our toolkit to file complaints, but we can take other action like cease and desist or other, um, or other, um, other ways of getting at um, a resolution. All right. Well, I mean, so do you have on those 222, you know, I mean, obviously, maybe not every one of them was violating mm -hmm. people's rights under lawful source of income, but my hunch is most of them probably were. So I could you do you have now or, or you know, if you don't have, I guess, you know, could you follow up with us to let us know, you know, in what percentage of those cases mm -hmm. did you find discrimination? And what were the steps that the commission then took? Sure. Um, you know, you obviously had this conversation with Councilmember Drum about what you right. did in that case. Uh, you know, so yeah, I guess let me leave the question there. Yeah. So one other thing I should mention, which thank you for for reminding me of, is that oftentimes we do get we do get negative tests. So we, where where there is actually we Great. can't uncover no. right, and that's a good that's good news. So there are you know. Um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases conducted a year, and that's not going to result in hundreds of hundred, uh, hundreds of hundreds of complaints filed. Um, what I can get back to you on is um, how those 222 entities tested on source of income, what 
sort of what those resolutions looked like. If we had some proportion of them that were negative tests, of the positive ones, how did those resolve? So I can get that information to you. We also, I should mention, have a source of income unit now at the commission, which is a new, a relatively new um, unit where we have attorneys and staff dedicated to just source of income cases. And they are primarily looking at getting people in housing. So those are not mostly commission initiated, although if we are running into repeat offenders, we may broaden cases um, to address systemic problems with certain housing providers. Um, but for the most part, these are people that are um, oftentimes homeless, have vouchers, are looking for housing, and so we are responding as quickly as possible to ensure that they get into housing. And, and that's um, obviously so that's a different with, approach. Yeah. For sure. And with complaint originated cases, the goal of of honoring the complainant and getting right. them what they're seeking is, of mm -hmm. course, the goal. But the uh, the 222 here, those are commission initiated, yep. right? And I don't know, obviously, if you sit on the web and look at listings, you can find people that just list, you know, no vouchers. vouchers. Yep. Then you don't even really need to do testing. You could just exactly. take a screenshot, presumably, mm -hmm. and, and go after them. But, you know, I, I think we want to get individuals into housing, but we know we're going to need to try to make some systemic change to make some examples of people who are repeat offenders or I, I don't yes. know, I, I guess. So if you could get back to us with both the the disposition of those 222, I mean, we don't have to go through everyone in detail, but mm -hmm. uh, cases and what steps, you know, are the, you know, are being taken to, to correct. And then, I mean, maybe it's the subject for a separate hearing, Mr. Chair. We've done them in the past, I know, but it might make sense on source of income if you're saying there's sort of a new unit and a broader strategy combining commission initiated and complaints mm -hmm. to try to think more comprehensively, perhaps we could have a hearing and drill down. I think that's something where, of course, we want complainants to get, get honored, but we also would really like to make some progress in yeah. not continuing to have such high levels of discrimination. Right. Um, you may have seen we also have, um, you know, testimony, written testimony here from Fair Housing Justice Center who um, uh, have been involved with you guys in doing an array of work, of testing work, including uh, on this area, mm -hmm. you know, and I think part of their, you know, the, it's their testimony that sort of flagged this issue as one where, though we've increased our testing, we haven't really managed to get in and, and make significant difference. So, you know, they say in the testimony they've presented us that in the testing that they did, that about 70 percent of their source of income tests yielded over evidence of illegal source of income. Mm -hmm. um, but they raised questions in their report about, all right, what's happening with that? What's mm -hmm. HRA doing? What are you guys doing? What mm -hmm. are we as a city okay. uh, doing? And I guess then I'll just ask more broadly, um, at the hearing we talked a little about how much of this made sense to be done by staff at the commission, how much you would do with contracts with some of the different yep. fair housing and civil rights organizations. Can you? Give us just the current status of the of the approach. Um, so right now we are currently um, we have a current contract with the Fair Housing Justice Center. They may have mentioned it in the in their testimony as well, um, and they um, that contract is. Um, is currently for $43,000 for them to do focus on source of income testing. Um, we also have a staff of testers. We have five staff, part-time staff, um, and one testing coordinator that um, reports directly to the assistant commissioner, um, Raj, who oversees our commission-initiated work. So we do some, some of it is conducted in-house, some of it is conducted uh, through the Fair Housing Justice Center. And do you think that, I mean, while acknowledging how much more that is than 2015 when we were doing none, do you think that's sufficient? Would you like to have more resources? You know, I think that the um, the more we do, the more I think there is to do, or at least that's how we we often feel. Um, I, I one thing I will say is that the. The testing can involve a whole, a whole host of different methods, some of which are much less of a heavy lift than others. So, for example, we can find discriminatory ads, which we see all the time. They're brought, you know, they're either brought to our, our attention or we're looking out for them. Um, those don't require a test necessarily, or it could, it wouldn't require a matched pair test. Um, we could um, just call, uh, as we did with the. Um, with the substance abuse treatment centers and said that, you know, we have a patient or a client who's trans and wants to be housed in this consistent with their gender identity and they would provide us information and that would be a positive test. Essentially, we wouldn't need to do a matched pair. So um, I, I'm just, I'm framing it to say that there are different methods that vary in sort of the degree of time and work and, re and you know, how many times we repeat the test in order to assure that we have, um, we're addressing systemic issues. Um, I think that um, we can always do more. 
um, as you've identified, source of income has been a has plagued this city um, as far as discrimination goes, and we are working diligently to address it both from a broader level, a systemic level, but also for on the individual level. Um, uh, and and again, while the test, while the commission initiated work has greatly expanded over the past few years, I think there are um, as new issues come to light, as new areas start to become, um, you know, more reported in the media, more people are coming forward, we're starting to see more issues that we'd like to address from a pattern and practice perspective, um, there's always more to of do. Of course, and look, you guys have done a lot more outreach and a lot more publicity, so more people know, so you're mm -hmm. going to get more complaints, you need more staff to process the complaints. As you get more complaints, you see more patterns, so... And more areas uh, of protection uh, to... You know, yeah. hopefully we're getting less discrimination and we're just seeing more of it, but anyway, so, um, and I know you guys are not supposed to administration frowns on, on budget advocacy, but the, obviously the committee and the council want us to be doing more in this area, and while appreciating you doing a lot more than you used to, um, it seems to me that this is an area where we're still putting a, a lot too little resource for the problem we know is out there, that is out there. So all right, two more quick questions. I guess one, if you had more, are there areas of this work that you'd like, you know you'd like to be doing more of, that if there were, you know, it's a lot of different kinds of things, mm -hmm. as you said, are there particular things that you think are emerging, um, that you're seeing, that you'd like to be able to drill down more on? Um, currently, I can say currently, we have sort of identified our areas of priority at the commission, and that's both from community, um, community-based organization input, what we're seeing sort of in complaints filed in state and federal court, and just what we're seeing sort of in the, in New York City and, and, and nationally, and that is um, gender, including gender identity and sexual harassment, race, criminal history, and source of income. So those are the areas that we've currently identified as our priority areas. I think those often will shift, but um, if you look at, um, in our annual report, we highlight you know the most common cases, the most common areas of um, discrimination consistently are disability, race, and gender. Um, and then on the housing side, source of income is up there as well. Um, uh, criminal history uh, and arrest record as well, at, again, because it's a relatively new area um, and, and often very overt. So those are the areas that we, we are currently prioritizing, um, but that can shift as, as you know, things change. Great. And my last question uh, is on one of the maybe the lesser ones, but uh, because it was something that we worked on together, I want to ask about credit history. Um, and again, that doesn't really need matched pair since it's illegal to ask uh, at the door. Uh, but I wonder, you're showing 37 commission investigated, initiated investigations on, on page seven here. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, do you know, or if not, can you get back to me on what's being found there? I think um, one of the things that we are that we are doing now, again, with respect to sort of um, capitalizing on uh, or, or trying to use our resources most effectively is looking at salary history, credit history, and criminal history all together. Yep. So oftentimes, if you're violating one, you may be violating others. Sure. Um, and also, the, the, those are easy, in, in some circumstances, easy to identify because it's on an application. It's in the ad. Um, and they may say um, that, you know, it's um, uh, pursuant to a credit check or something like that where they haven't, they don't fit into one of the exemptions um, uh, or they're copying, you know, sort of the fair, the national Fair Credit Reporting Act kind of disclaimers that, that, that aren't appropriate in certain circumstances. But I can get back to you on how much of it is sort of in the application um, and posting side as opposed to other methods of, of rooting out credit history. Great. And I'm asking a little less about what are your methods and a little more what are your findings, Got it. Uh, okay. you know, on all three of those. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I have my, you know, as the sponsor on credit history, but the other two are very important. So if you could just let us know. Sure in uh, of these tests where are you you know what percentage of times are you finding violations of the law and then in those cases what have you how have you followed up got it great wonderful thank you thank you very much thank you mr chair for for letting well, you're welcome uh, council member um linda uh, council member uh was center please both contracts i'm honored that you think of me as Brandon, whatever. Um, thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Deputy Commissioner, for all your good work and the good work of your staff. It's it's just been a pleasure working with you. Um, I'm going to follow up on three areas of your testimony. The first one is on page uh, five, I think, where you talk about the settlement with Lenox Hill Radiology for 
failure to accommodate patients with disabilities. This is an issue I've heard about frequently from the disabilities community. And I'm wondering if when you identify issues like this and you investigate and, and get to resolution, do you also communicate with the mayor's office so that the public sector is also meeting the same standards so that someone um, with a disability who goes into an H and H hospital would similarly, um, you know, get the proper treatment. Um, so, with respect to um, to well, I guess there's a few things. One, we work very closely with the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Um, and when we make any sort of announcements around these kinds of cases, we work with them um, to ensure that the information is getting out both to our community of contacts and to theirs. Um, you know, I think that there's a real, there's real meaning and and our hope is change based on simply the announcement of these kinds of resolutions so that we're moving the needle beyond just the entities that we're um, enforcing or resolving cases against. Um, we often do work on an intergovernmental level with other city agencies around compliance. Um, as you are aware, we enforce the law over both public and private entities, which means we enforce the law again over you know city agencies as employers. Um, in the context of a hospital, it would be as an employer, possibly or provider of a public accommodation. Um, in the context of providing accessible um, medical equipment, um, and um, so we do often work with our sister agencies on those issues. Um, we have not historically engaged in commission-initiated cases against our sister agencies because we can, we, we do attempt to work through um, changes and compliance on an intergovernmental level. I, I certainly am not suggesting that you investigate compliance, but instead that you advocate mm -hmm. for compliance. I think that letting the mayor's office of people with disabilities know about your success in this area um, um, would uh, <laughs> you're getting a lot of notes <laughs> um, uh, makes sense to me, but I think that they would share the same frustration um, if they were here, that they're well aware that this is a an issue for the disabilities community. And I, I certainly, um, you know, I think that this these kinds of cases are incredibly important for us at the commission. So if you or any council member uh, knows of, um, of providers, medical providers or hospitals in their district that are inaccessible or not providing accessible, re reasonable accommodations or accessible equipment, we should know. Because again, this is a model that I think was unprecedented um, in, in some ways for the commission. And we can you know, now use this case as a model moving forward for how we can uh, build resolutions that make meaningful change. Um, I can also say that this is not the only one. Um, it was, we, we, we are investigating multiple um, providers, medical providers and others on issues related to this. And you know, so again, we're, we would love to learn about more direct our resources in that way. And so we're happy to partner with you on that too. Thank you. Do you work with independence care systems? We do. Great. Very okay. closely. Good. In fact, one of our commissioners, um, Regina Estella, um, is the leader of the, of the organization. Or Great. Not, not, yes. OK. Um, they're definitely the people who educate me. Secondly, I'm wondering if we could go to page three about the outcomes of your tests on cases of salary history, pregnancy, and gender? 
Sure. Um, so what we've, um, I, I don't have the full breakdown for outcomes, but I'm happy to follow up with you as I will with uh, Councilmember Lander on some of the areas he requested. Um, again, I think that the, as we've sort of, um, as more protections have been, um, have been codified into the human rights law around hiring, um, it's been a fruitful exercise for us to look at hiring practices broadly when we are in doing commission initiated investigations, which include looking at whether questions are being asked around criminal history, salary history, and credit history. So at when the new law went into effect, that became part of the uh, routine, essentially, yeah. when we were looking at hiring. Um, on pregnancy, the tests uh, look more like someone is applying for a job and the tester will reveal that they are two or three months pregnant, that they have certain restrictions. Will that matter? Will that um, make a difference? And I think the industries that we focused on in that space are retail and fast food, um, sort of hospitality. Um, again, sort of in the low wage industries mm -hmm. where we know that these are persistent problems. Um, and with respect to gender, um, that is, often um, that may be gender identity, um, but I, in, because gender identity is encapsulated into yeah. gender, um, but I can get back to you on that, um, uh, on those, and, that on, and on the sort of outcomes that we've seen in those cases specifically. Are these, for the commission initiated investigations, the numbers you have here, um, are those cases that have been completed, or is it some set subset of those have been completed? Sure. So um, there are many of the cases that were filed in fiscal year 2018 are not yet resolved. Um, but the cases that have been resolved, which I mention on the bottom of page four, there has been 120 cases total in the past two calendar years. And I know it's sort of imperfect how we're reporting out these numbers because of a calendar year versus fiscal year. But um, 120 cases, either through a complaint being filed or through just a pre-complaint investigation, have been resolved um, in the past two years. So that's 120 total. And those cases were most likely started, you know, somewhat, some, you know, some combination of 2016, 2017 to be, to be resolved in 2017, 2018. That was really exciting. Yeah. Thank you. And lastly, another category I'm very interested in is on page seven, the one um, uh, for public accommodations and housing for people with disabilities and employment. Sure, yes. So um, in the public accommodations context, um, we are, um, again, learning from um, community-based organizations and others, even our own internal, you know, staff who are people with disabilities about inaccessible, you know, we're talking, and we focus, I should say, um, in this space on much bigger entities, well-resourced entities around accessibility to different um, parts of a, a multi level store or um, a, a fitness center, for example, um, where these places are just not accessible at all. And again, we're not talking necessarily about small, um, you know, uh, mom and pop kind of entities, but larger, um, well-resourced and sophisticated entities. And so that's um, where we've been focusing to some degree in the public accommodation space. In employment and disability, um, I will have to get back to you on, on exactly what we're looking at in those and whether it's um, through applications or otherwise um, um, in, and what those outcomes are. And when you, when the commission is talking about disabilities, are, does it, what areas of disabilities does it span? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly across our protections are quite broad, um, and we published legal enforcement guidance on disability accommodations and protections in July of 2018, um, which is a, a very extensive document on exactly, um, you know, the how broad our definition is and what um, covered entities' obligations are under the New York City Human Rights Law, which is actually more comprehensive in many ways than the ADA. Um, but for the yeah. purposes of testing, um, you know, I. I I will, I will have to get back to you. I know that we are looking a lot at physical accessibility. So we're talking about people with mobility-related um, impairments or restrictions. Um, 
but I can get back to you uh, on more uh, sort of what the full range of what we're looking at is. That's exactly my question. Yeah, sure. If you could, in the disability category that you have here, break that down by type of disability, that would be fascinating <laughs> to see. Lastly, I want to thank the individual who is um, doing CART today. She, I'm watching her write down what I'm saying right now. <laughs> um, no, I'm watching her uh, translate uh, the words of everyone here, and she's great. Thank you so much for, uh, I don't, I'm not sure who arranged it, if it was the city council or you, but whoever it is, thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, and thank you also for thanking <laughs> this wonderful person for what she's doing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, you mentioned that, that there's an increase of uh, testing, you know, for the last uh, few years. So we imagine that uh, that requires a lot of resources in some uh, modification, plan modification, and uh, additional strategic planning also. Can you tell us about you know, uh, the effort of the, the commission or the, the, I would say that uh, the challenges, you know, that uh, come with the increase of testing and the increase of works that the uh, co commission has to do? Sure. Can you tell us about the challenges that uh, uh, the commission is facing? to pursue the effort to tackle the discrimination in New York City? I think th th there's a few things. The first I would say is our ability to be flexible in our response. Um, one of the reasons why we've built up our pre-complaint work, like cease and desist letters, negotiations without ever filing a complaint, um, um, other kinds of requests for information, requests to interview witnesses, even before we file a complaint is because we have by statute and by our rules of practice, um, very strict sort of protocols we have to follow with respect to filing a complaint, waiting for the respondent to respond, giving them extensions of time to respond, um, and going through sort of that administrative litigation process. And that can take time and resources. And sometimes people need immediate relief. As we discussed, uh, people who are seeking housing and they're being turned away because they have a voucher, a pregnant worker who needs an accommodation or else she will lose her job or she will um, put her pregnancy at risk. Um, and so we are constantly challenged by looking at broader systemic issues where we really want affirmative relief across the board and balancing the needs of people who are coming to us with immediate pressing concerns. So that pulls us in different directions and balancing resources to address both of those areas is important um, and, a, and, a, and a challenge. I think too, um, we are receiving more information in, in the multiple, in, in all the different ways that we receive information about discrimination. So whether it's people coming to us um, to file complaints, whether it's anonymous tips, whether it's through social media or through our community-based um, organization partners, more people are coming to us. And again, that, that requires us to, to be flexible and be nimble in our response and to balance increased numbers of, of complaints and, and other ways of, of bringing our attention to issues. Um, and then I will also say that our, our law has expanded significantly since um, Commissioner Malalas uh, took um, over the agency in 2015. Um, I think there's seven new substantive areas of protection, um, uh, almost, I believe, 30 new um, amendments to the human rights law that we've incorporated. And so as our, which, which we are not which we are happy with, which we think is Im quite important. But as our, our jurisdiction expands, we are um, we want to we want to educate people on those new protections. We want people to know what they are, um, and so we're publishing more information. Um, but again, it's it's a challenge to get that information out to get people to learn about it in an accessible and easy way. So I think we we're we're and again on you know when. We're seeing the contraction of rights on the federal level, um, people feeling particularly targeted and vulnerable. We want to be able to stand up and say that you have rights and resources in New York City and a place to go. And that becomes um, ever more challenging when people feel like their communities are under attack um, and they are um, and they have an inherent distrust of, of government and they're not 
making the distinction as most people wouldn't between you know city government versus the federal government. So those are some of the challenges that I think we grapple with on the on a daily basis. Uh, we know that uh, as I said uh, previously, this is a very very important topic, and some of the time and all the time, it, it takes a collaboration, you know, a team to get the result that uh, we are looking for. Can you uh, tell us about the collaboration between uh, our HRA and also uh, the commission in terms of income discrimination, income you know, disparity? Can you tell us about uh, the collaboration uh, you know, uh, the commission work with uh, uh, HRA sure. in terms of determining income dis discrimination? So um, I... I can give you a little bit of the information that I have today, but I think certainly we can follow up with more if that would be useful. Um, uh, HRA um, is um, a partner on tackling source of income discrimination. They have um, some dedicated staff working on this issue, and we are in regular communication um, between the two units. So there's a unit within HRA, um, there's a unit at, at CCHR. Um, they are uniquely positioned because they are administering the many of the housing vouchers um, that people are then using using to find housing. Um, we are differently situated in that we are at the enforcement agency over that provision of the law. Um, so it is important that we share information, which we are doing, um, and they are sending cases to us. They are also, from what I understand, bringing cases um, uh, through uh, the state court process because they you know, outside of the commission, there are other ways of of um, bringing claims, and I believe they are doing that through um, delegation by um, the law department um, th into state court. So um, that is the information I have today, but I'm happy to, to provide more if that would be useful um, outside of the hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we know that, and I, I always love, you know, uh, mentioning the wisdom of my father, because he said, my son, there is no perfection when you do something, you cannot get perfection. There is always room for improvement. You always try, you always have to strive to do better, better than yesterday. So uh, if we talk about the achieving the goal of the commission, reaching the goal, or getting the result, and tackling you know, a, a discrimination, what do you think that uh, should be done to uh, improve the, the the performance of the commission. What do you believe that should be done to make sure that we reach the goal of you know uh, tackling the discrimination and preventing it and resolving the case of discrimination? I think we will have achieved our goal when New Yorkers know that um, know what their rights are know where they can go um, to, um, to seek remedies, and that they have an accessible um, venue um, where they can seek the kind of relief that they could get if they had a lawyer and went to state or federal court with the same claims. So we're talking about um, um, the same civil penalties or the same what would be in federal court, you know, punitive damages, the same emotional distress damages, back pay. Um, and we are building up a venue where you are getting the same kind of monetary relief and being made whole at the commission um, as you would if you were to bring your claims in state or federal court. Um, the thing that I think, again, that we are constantly challenged on is ensuring that New Yorkers know about us, that we're not like the a, a, a well-kept secret, um, that we are... Um, that we are reaching all corners of, of the city and that even if not everyone is utilizing us, they know about what we're doing, they know that they can refer family and friends, that they know what their rights are in New York City, um, and that they have a, a friendly, accessible venue to come to if they need to. Or, I should say, they are using our publications, which um, you know, our legal enforcement documents are our frequently asked questions, our one-pagers, to advocate for themselves, um, which we are hearing uh, folks are doing quite a bit. Their advocacy organizations and community-based organizations are actually using what we're putting out um, to inform uh, potential respondents of how we interpret the law that, you know, essentially as a way to, to self-advocate and educate um, around the strength of the city human rights law. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me ask you one more question before I call uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. We want to continue with some questions. So we were talking about immigrant people, and New York City is a wonderful city. I'm telling you, I've, I had the privilege to travel to many countries and to live in some of them, you know, a few of them. But New York City is a great city, a city of opportunity, and you all know that. There is room for everybody. But many of the immigrant people, when they come over here, as I said before, this is a different system. New York City is a great city, but this is a tough system too. Tough system, especially for immigrant people. The people who are not proficient in English also. And uh, when you have cases, you have immigrant people facing discrimination. Yes, you handle the cases, do testing, investigation, but do you have in place also something to take their hand, help them navigate through the system, understand what they are facing mm -hmm. and what they have to do in order to get the protection or the justice they are looking for? Mm -hmm. um, so. Yes, as best as we can. We we recognize, and you know, we have um, the commission has tripled in size more or less since uh, Commissioner Malala started in 2015, and ha she has really intentionally brought on staff that have the community connections, that have the credibility in communities across the city, whether it's, um, you know, the West African uh, immigrant community or the um, South Asian community or um, the Muslim Arab community um, or Jewish communities. We have brought in staff that not only represent those communities, have worked in those communities, speak many of those communities' languages, but um, have, she's also created dedicated roles. Um, we have a Muslim Arab South Asian communities lead advisor. We have an African immigrant communities lead advisor. We have a Jewish communities liaison. We have an LGBTQ lead advisor. These are these are positions that never existed at the commission before, and I think are probably actually quite unique positions generally um, in, in, in other civil rights agencies. Um, and that and the reason is a recognition that some of these communities have never had a relationship with government. Um, government is um, not transparent, it's challenging, it's bureaucratic, it's complicated. Um, and so that in creating many of these positions and bringing in people that have worked in these communities and bring with them such credibility, um, and I'm honored to be working with with all of them it allows us to be a friendly face um, and work with people and share what their what information they need to have um, we've created um, resource forums throughout the city where communities have never had access to government before um, we um, and then I should also say on the business side you know there are so many immigrant owned businesses that have obligations under the city human rights law and we find that Educating small businesses is incredibly important. We are not interested in fining or penalizing small businesses when they don't have the resources or a, you know a general counsel to under to teach them or educate them on on all the changing areas of the human rights law. So we really want to work with the bid associations, with the chambers of commerce, with SBS and others to educate small businesses on their obligations under the city human rights law. Um, we are walking literally down business corridors all throughout the city with the new sexual harassment posters that are required to be up in every business and handing them to people so that they can put them up right then and there. Um, so we recognize that people have different relationships with government. Um, they have, may have no relationship with government and that we want to be, if we can be that entree into government, that is a very important role that we hope to play. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, let me say that I appreciate very well, very much, you know, uh, what uh, you are doing, the staff and the, the leadership of the commission, uh, you are doing for the immigrant people, for those who are in need of assistance in New York City, because uh, 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 that's what makes New York City such a wonderful city. And I think that many of us, we are blessed and fortunate, but I think that we have the moral obligation to share our blessing to those people who are not as fortunate as we are. And I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so very much. And, uh, uh, and by doing that, we are making a difference in, in the life of so many people. And also, we are making our city a better city. And... Uh, uh, I, I got a question. I, I appreciate that uh, the commission is doing every, 
all the effort to reach all ethnic background, as many ethnic ethnicities that you know you can. And my uh, my question is that, that in New York City we have a large large Haitian community, people who speak Haitian Creole. Even we are competing with Miami. Miami said that you know they have the largest, you know. The, the largest uh, Haitian community. And we in New York City, we say we have the largest community in the United States. But we can, you know, we can uh, uh, collaborate. <laughs> yes, so we will get an agreement. But my question is, do you have any Haitian speaking Creole in the staff of the commission? Because we, we are serving a lot of Haitian in New York City. Do you have any Haitian speaking Creole? Yes, we yeah. do. Um, I know for a fact that our assistant commissioner for community outreach, um, Frank Joseph, is um, uh, speaks fluent uh, Haitian Creole, um, and I can identify other folks um, on the law enforcement team for you, um, and I believe others in our law, in our community outreach team as well, um, and, and get back to you if you'd like to know exactly how many and, and what positions they hold. But we do have staff that speak Creole fluently. Thank you so very much. Councilmember yes. Rosenthal, please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chair, for all this, these good questions, and um, it's just great hearing. So I really appreciate your shining a spotlight on this work. Um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, I, I have a question for you about um, the hearing loss community. And we're about to hear testimony from the public, and I'm asking you a question that I think is important from his testimony, but I, and I want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, if lawsuits, is there coordination between the city law department and CCHR on lawsuits having to do with human rights violations where, I guess that's the first question. And the second question is, again, this idea of trying to make city government better, mm -hmm. do you have a role in making sure that city agencies change in order to be compliant with the human rights laws of New York City? Sure. Um, I might need a just a clarification on the first point. Um, so we do coordinate with the city, uh, with the law department, but I'm not sure. Um, th so they obviously represent the city when in a defensive posture when the city is sued. Um, we are not regularly engaging with them on those cases. If you know, again, they, there may be allegations of a um, of a human rights law violation. When there are in state or federal court, it's required that the that the plaintiff serve us with a copy of the complaint, so we're aware of what it is and are, we are following that and monitoring those cases. Um, we are also in in collaboration and coordination with the law department when they are in an affirmative posture. So they actually defend our decisions when our decisions are um, are appealed. We make we have our own decision-making authority. Um, the city de law department defends our our decisions in court. So we see it. We see sort of they play different roles depending on um, the posture. Um, so I'm not sure if that actually answers your question. So I am talking about the first instance mm -hmm. where the law department might settle a case. In this example, it has to do with um, police officers who uh, wear hearing aids and are discriminated against either in applying to the NYPD or on the job mm -hmm. simply because they wear a hearing aid. And the law department settled cases or, sure, you know, did everything but, you know, admit wrongdoing, but unclear whether or not the NYPD has changed its behavior. Mm -hmm. So when cases are in litigation like that, we are not, as far as I'm aware, involved or consulted. Um, when the city is a defendant in, in state or federal court. We are 
occasionally made aware of, well, we are we are aware of cases when they identify city human rights law violations simply because we are served with them, we monitor those cases. Sometimes community-based organizations may identify these cases for us as well, um, but um, there is no um, formalized approach um, in which the, the law department would involve us in those kinds of cases. Upon hearing about this case, if the resident were to send you you know, mm -hmm. let you know about mm -hmm. this. Is that something that you would pursue, you the agency? Sure. Um, again, when we are made aware of possible um, <laughs> compliance issues with other city agencies, we do work as best as we can with, um, through our sort of intergov relationships, um, you know, to ensure that they know what their obligations are under the city human rights law, um, to offer our help in creating better practices um, or changing policies. Um, sometimes that's successful and sometimes it's not. Um, so we, we do, and this is again a new function of our agency to kind of insert ourselves in these conversations. And so again, sometimes they are um, very productive and sometimes we offer and, and agencies choose not to take us up on it, and that is within their purview. Unless you were to sue them. <laughs> if someone brings a complaint to us alleging a violation of a city hum of, of um, the city human rights law against a city agency, we absolutely take those cases and investigate them as we would any case against a private entity. Okay. Um, and then you just mentioned that the law department also defends CCHR's uh, positions. Can you tell me um, how many cases have happened of your 120 that have been resolved and have all of them been decided in the city's favor? So with these resolutions, what's, what's great about these is um, f from the, my best understanding, and um, I, I think I'm correct here, that these are resolutions in which there was a negotiated agreement. So there's no sort of challenge to them in state court. So you can actually, what, so I think that's actually quite meaningful because it's not, um, it's, it's the ability of our agency to conciliate, which is a far more effective in many ways, um, approach. It, it creates wide ranging relief and gets um, individuals who are wronged their damages. I misspoke um, to refer to the 120 cases sure. then. Are there any cases where the law department has had to defend a position in state or federal court and what's the outcome of that? Sure. Um, there have been um, a few of those cases where um, we have issued a decision in order through our the commissioner's office, and then one of the parties appeals that commission that decision in order in state court, and um, we've had um, success in a, in a couple of those cases where um, the state court has affirmed our um, our decision, or where perhaps at the state court level we've gotten a, not a great decision and we've appealed it to the appellate division, and then we get a really good decision. So we are working in our general counsel office is the area that um, that works directly with the law department on those cases and has put in I should say a great deal of effort to ensure that our cases are given you know priority and that we are in that we are creating a very strong record in state court um, on um, on the on upholding the decisions out of the commissioner's office the numbers are low because the cases that go to final decision and order represent a small percentage of our of all of our cases just like in any litigation a case that goes all the way through to trial to a report and recommendation at oath to a final decision from our commissioner is going to be a small percentage of the of the overall caseload um, and then of those there's only going to be a, 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 a few of those that go to uh, get are appealed in state court, but we work very closely with the law department on um, ensuring that we are um, we are building a really strong record in which state courts are deferential to the decisions of the agency, um, you know, and, and applying the appropriate standards in, in state court. Could you send the committee counsel, and I'd be interested in seeing uh, those cases and the Absolutely. findings. Um, so which have been solidified. Yeah. Have any been rejected? Have you lost, as a city law department, lost any of those cases? We have, there may be one recent case in which we are, um, 
where it's uh, the damages and penalties were reduced, where we are working with the law department to actually um, appeal that to the appellate division. So it's it's not fi- it's not final final, um, but we were um, discouraged at that the um, state court had reduced um, the the penalties and damages award, and are working with the law department again to to move that up to the appeals court. Um, but that's the one I'm currently aware of. I may be um, there may be others, but I can we can get back to you. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. Those are wonderful questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, we know that uh, the commission has been dealing with a lot of cases, a lot of cases. There are so many cases. They are, they are all important. And can you tell us, uh, give us the time frame between receiving the complaint and starting the investigation. How long did it take from the time that the commission received complaint or report? How long did it take enough for the commission to start the investigation, mm-hmm. the process of the investigation? So it, it varies greatly depending on how the information has come to us. Um, in certain circumstances, we will act very quickly um, uh, where capacity allows. So if it's, um, you know, uh, for example, the, the example I gave of Prada where they had, um, you know, racist um, iconography in their uh, merchandise in a, in a store window, we learned of it that morning and, were, and sent a cease and desist that day. Um, we, wor- we worked very quickly to make that happen and make a, a, a bold statement um, that this was just unacceptable and a violation of the human rights law because it made it makes people feel unwelcome. People of color feel unwelcome in their stores to see these um, to see these images in the in the window. Um, in other circumstances, it may not be well. Certainly, it will not always be one day um, where a complainant, an individual, is coming forward. Typically, they will call our in, they will often call our info line or get connected to three one one get connected to us through three one one where they will get an appointment to meet with an attorney that will take a couple weeks to they'll make the appointment for a few weeks after their call um, and then they will meet with an attorney and then we will file um, a a complaint uh, on their behalf maybe a a few weeks after that so it could be several weeks to several months before the complaint is actually filed and served on the respondent the respondent then has 30 days to respond and can get extensions if they can show that they um, have um, if they have reason to need more time and often we will give them more time because we want them to be engaged in the process and we want them we want both parties to have due process um, if we learn of a tip through a community-based organization or through our um, someone submitting a tip online um, we can act on that relatively quickly through testing or other methods sending out a cease and desist or an RFI a request for information um, so it really does vary depending on how the information comes comes to us, um, what our case docket looks like, and, um, and, and, and our resources. Are there certain cases that can be considered as uh, urgent, at, as a priorities, cases that you should act on right away? Absolutely. You know, based on the urgency and stuff like that? Yes. Um, so we, what we call sort of internally is fast track cases mm-hmm. where um, we're talking about people with disabilities in, who might be um, unable to get out of their apartments because it's become inaccessible. Um, uh, cases involving uh, accommodations in the workplace for people with disabilities where they need an accommodation, they're not getting one, and they may end up losing their job or being forced to go out on unpaid leave. Similarly, for pregnancy accommodations, um, if someone is facing retaliation in the workplace for coming forward, and they may also be in a place where they're going to lose their job, um, source of income with uh, being turned away from housing and not being able to access housing, and they're currently um, in in not stable housing or in uh, shelter. Um, So we have priority areas that will move much more quickly. And sometimes that may mean, again, as I discussed earlier, the ability to be flexible. It may mean calling the landlord, calling the employer, and saying, you must provide X, Y, and Z. Are you aware of the human rights law? This is what your obligations are. Um, and try to resolve things as quickly as possible in that way. So yes, we do try to triage and fast track cases where we know that there's an urgent situation or if the statute of limitations is about to run. So in most cases, people have one year to come to the commission. If someone is coming up on that one year deadline, we will screen for that and make sure that they get in more quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for your testimony, and thank you also 
for the wonderful job that you are doing and all the uh, staff and the leadership of the commission, you know, for what uh, you all you are doing to make sure that uh, our city can remain a fair city and a place where people can live with dignity and respect. Thank you so very much. Thank you Have so much day. for this hearing. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to call uh, Jerry Bergman from Housing uh, Loss Association of America. Yeah, please, would you please? Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eugene, and members and staff of the committee. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to pick up on what Council Member Rosenthal uh, kindly Could you please uh, state to. your name, please, for the record? Could you state your name, please? Uh, yes. I, I'm Jerry Bergman, and I was born and raised and lived most of my life in our great city. Um, there might be a slight pause in my responding to any questions because of my hearing disability. Thank you, I understand that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Johns Hopkins research says 48 million Americans have some degree of hearing loss. That includes one in every five people age 12 and over. Hearing loss is the number one service-related disability among returning combat veterans. I'm here today to draw your attention to continuing discrimination by the New York City Police Department against both tenured officers and applicants who wear hearing aids. In recent years, the NYPD has settled civil cases out of court brought by three plaintiffs, two tenured officers whose jobs were terminated abruptly and an applicant who was denied admission to the police academy solely because of hearing loss. Those cases were settled out of court and at considerable expense to the city. The two officers were given compensation and offered re-employment while the applicant was admitted and is now serving on the force. During the applicant's case, it was discovered in, it revealed in discovery that over a hundred other applicants to the police academy were also denied employment opportunities because they wore hearing aids, probably including some very deserving combat veterans. A case currently before the court involves a young mother of four whose NYPD career was abruptly terminated nearly four years ago after she started wearing a hearing aid to compensate for hearing loss suffered while participating in required semi-annual firearms training. Because she had less than 20 years service, she was only given a partial disability pension and her family has struggled financially. Over eight months ago, I presented these facts at the CCHR to an assistant commissioner of the Law Enforcement Bureau and a supervising attorney. Last April, I appealed in writing to the then New York City public advocate. A blue wall of silence seems to surround the NYPD as I've heard nothing in response. I leave you with these questions. Where is the oversight of the NYPD's policies and practices? Why is there no public accountability for such discrimination on the basis of hearing loss that hearing aids largely correct? Why does the NYPD conduct its treatment of people with hearing loss in secret and its process of determining officers and candidates' ability to fulfill job requirements behind closed doors? And why does the NYPD continue to avoid setting objective standards that hearing aid wearers must meet? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Beckman. 
This is, a, I believe this is a very, very important uh, issue. And we in the Committee of Civil and Human Rights, we would like to look into this uh, situation. And I thank you so much for bringing this uh, uh, issue to us. So what I want to do, I want to have your information and my office will contact you because we want to look into this situation. And thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you. I, thank you. I will look forward to that, and I appreciate your concern very thank much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. thank you. So now, since there is no other speakers, the meeting is adjourned.